All right, my friends, we are back on a live stream. It's late. It's almost midnight, but you know what? No time is too late for the guys that we got here. We got Don Don of HD 2020. Jackson! Jackson! And we got Anthony Grimani. Man, where have you been? Not worthy. Where I've, have you been? I've been to South America. I've been to Terra del Fuego and back, man, on a bicycle. No. Well, welcome Argentina. back, my friend, to the show that never ends. Good to have you back. Today we are going to be talking about amplifier specs, what's important in them, what to look for, how is this going to determine the experience you're going to get in your home theater. I've done tons of videos about measurements of amplifiers, but we don't know always talk about the exact specs of it and how to look at how to look at what the manufacturer is spec in because it's not always apples to apples and that's the biggest problem in this industry is that it lacks standards. So you could get an amplifier that looks like it may have good specs, but you got to read the fine print and we got to know what these specs mean and, and how they're going to ultimately change the enjoyment or the experience in your room with your speakers and your room acoustics and your listening habits. Right. And there's more. There's not just the specs that they show you on the normal stuff. And then there's a whole bunch of other functional specs or what I call behavioral specs that matter for your enjoyment. Let me introduce that. Let's say you have an amplifier that produces an input to out signal that's perfect, but because it's got a heat reliability issue, it shuts down in the loud portions of your movie or your mm -hmm. music. That's not useful. And so we're, we're going to cover like the broad array of all of that stuff that matters. So uh, we have a slide presentation. I want to go over it to you, but I wanted to show you some measurements that I've, I've put up over here. I'm going to share my screen real quick and just talk to you guys just to kind of wet your whistle here on what we're going to be covering. So I pulled up um, a couple of reviews. Some of them are old, but they still show telling things here. Do you see my, um, my screen now with the Yamaha? Yeah. So this is an older Yamaha Avantage receiver. Um, it's one of their low-end ones. I think it's like an $800 unit. It's the RXA 860. And you can see here, the, this is the preamp outputs. And this is what I found um, most receivers, if you drive them past a volt and a half, even though the preamp isn't clipping, the power amplifiers are clipping. And if you're not using those power amplifiers, it's still corrupting the preamp outputs. And you see this FFT. This is a bad measurement. So if you're driving a, if you're trying to reach maximum gain out of an amplifier, it takes at least two volts RMS to get maximum gain out of an amplifier that has an AV of 29 dB. You know, if it's a THX kind of gain structure. So or, even or before gain structure, actually, right? That's like the most classic input to output gain, 28x, which is 29 dB. Yeah. Exactly. So you're looking at this Yamaha receiver, which it, people are going to say, well, if it doesn't have a good enough amp section, I could use the preamp outputs. Well, look at this thing at 1.6 volts. You got only about 50 dB of between the fundamental and the third harmonic. That's not great. Now, that, well, that, that, that was an entry level model too, Gene. It was, but yeah. it, but at the point of the matter is, shouldn't matter. This, I'm well, trying to show why things can sound different. See, at a volt, it's okay. At a volt, it's actually behave. That's a really good measurement. You're 100 dB below the fundamental. That's inaudible. Anything, in my opinion, below 60 dB below the fundamental is pretty inaudible. Right. So uh, let me interrupt you. You said that's a bad measurement. That was a good measurement on your part. That's a measurement of bad performance, right? Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm going to also help people who are watching. It's like that, that's a measurement of distortion. Uh, just so you know, 40 decibels down means the distortion is at 1% if you did right. the math of decibels and 60 dB down is at 0.1%. Now, somewhere between 0.1 and 1%, you start to hear, you actually start to notice it's getting hardened. It's getting not good. And really what matters uh, the most in terms of that sound of like, yeah, it doesn't sound very clean is not necessarily the first or second or third spikes that are to the right of the main signal. But it's the start stuff that's further up because you hear that better. There's there's a better separation in frequencies, and you notice that as crud. It, it just it's just like I don't know. I just turned it up, and it sounds harsh. Yeah, exactly. There's no need for that. That's just a that's just bad. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways to design that bad, and it shouldn't matter. It's just don't do that. So here's another thing that you'll never find on a spec sheet, and this is a problem more with receivers than dedicated amplifiers. Is there? I call it nanny control. It's the it's the input. It's the uh, circuits inside the receiver that thermally limit, so it doesn't generate too much heat. 
and it doesn't shut the receiver down or it doesn't yeah. damage the output devices. Yeah. I've never seen a receiver, and I'm not trying to beat up on Yamaha because they make some great products. Right. But I've never seen a receiver do this where as the power is going up, it's going up, it's distorting, and bam, look at that. Wow. It's limiting the power and it's bringing it back here. Wow. Later. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something like that, in my opinion. If you're slamming some bass or you're doing some really dynamic program material, it wouldn't be impossible for this uh, limiting circuit to click in and it could be causing some compression in your signal when you're listening to music at yeah. loud levels. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting thing to show. Um, if we start talking about class D amplifiers, they're they're a lot better these days than they were back in 2009. But here's an example of a class D amplifier that didn't have a good feedback topology. And if you, if you put a load on it, that was, if you put an open circuit on it, you get massive frequency peaking and the output characteristic of that amplifier, the frequency response would change depending on the load. So yeah. you could have some speakers that sound good with this amplifier, some speakers that don't sound good with this amplifier because the amplifier's behavior changes with load impedance. Right. That's not good. You That's want it to be. Good. You want it to be independent of of the low of of the of typical reasonable load impedances. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now that doesn't just and this wasn't a cheap product, but here's an an example of a product that's very expensive, an eleven thousand dollar pass lab amplifier, which everybody claims is audiophile. And I do like the sound of their amplifier. When I measured this amp, when I listened to this amplifier, I liked it, but I did notice it was a more forward sounding amplifier than a class A amplifier that I had. And then I started doing FFTs, and here you go. Look at how look at how the FFT's behavior. This is not state of the art, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Your DC offsets high on it. I mean, there's just it's not a stellar measurement. And this is a company that doesn't believe in using a lot of feedback. Yeah, that's a, a classic audiophile thing is low feedback. Um, again, for those of you who don't know, FFT just means it's a spectrum analysis using fast Fourier transform methodology. It's just a way to to look. In the frequency domain, you put a signal in, um, what you should get out is that signal. And most electronics are gonna have some side effects and they all wanna be below threshold of audibility. And um, it's a fair amount of the, the upper end audiophile stuff that's like, I don't care, as long as it sounds good, I'm happy. And you know, that's one philosophy. Um, and then you get down to like, what do you hear? I guarantee that all of those harmonics of the original signal that are actually adding distortion, their pollution, the original signal on some program material will be audible um, first as just harshness. And then later, if you listen carefully to certain instruments, you're gonna go, that just sounds dirty. It doesn't sound like a clean flute or a clean saxophone. Um, can't do that, not mm -hmm. okay. So someone has a super chat here. They have a Parasound amplifier that's rated at 250 watts. Thanks for the super chat. How do I determine the max output? Um, well, that depends on a lot of things. And we, we could talk about this. And I was talking to you, Anthony, about this the other day. So if you've got an amplifier that has one large centralized power supply, and it has two, five, seven channels, and they tell you it's 200 watts times seven. So with that large power supply, if you're only driving one channel, it's not atypical for that channel to put out a good 300 watts RMS unclipped, just mm -hmm. because you have a larger central power supply that it could pull from. Mm -hmm. and has more reserves. And that's mm -hmm. why it's always an advantageous to have one big power supply and then have you know multiple channels feed off of it as opposed to mono blocks where you have a tr transformer for each channel. Yeah. Never like that approach. This yeah. is, having a big central power supply, in my opinion, is better. So, so the question here um, is, it only mentions 250 RMS. By the way, power RMS, if you actually look at the math of it, makes no sense. What it means- There's no such thing, yeah. Is, the, the maximum voltage measured RMS, root mean square, that you can get into a certain load, eight ohms, four ohms, two ohms, who knows? Let's yep. say, in most cases, it's an eight ohm load. Um, and then and it says 60 amperes peak. That means that somehow one channel of the thing has the ability to feed up to 60 amperes into a load, which is enormous. Way, those are usually, way, way. those are bogus specs usually. Those are like for a millisecond on Tuesday right. when it's driving a very specific 0.1 ohm load resistor. Right, right. Harman, Down with Harman, the wind in your tail. Um, Harman, it, that with their instantaneous current spec, right. it's garbage spec. 
Right. My um, and that's not really that useful. What you want to know, and I'm going to get into this, uh, and it's sort of like a rethinking of what we've been saying in our industry. What you want to know is your speaker needs so many volts to be able to produce certain sound pressure level. How many volts can you put into the speaker given that it's a certain load? That's been measured in watts, but watts is confusing. I've mm -hmm. always been confused by watts because it depends on what frequency you're at. And so I'm going to talk about some stuff that you will see sometimes, and you'll see more in, in the near future. I'll explain why. But so the the question is, how do I tell my maximum output on my Parasound amp? First of all, Parasound makes great amps. Richard yeah. Tramplow, if you're listening, great great bunch of guys. Um, and how how can you tell? Well, is it single channel driven, two channels driven? Amp the the amperage at output doesn't really tell you anything because what you need in a power amp is volts and amperes. I'm going to explain that a little later. But ultimately, a power amp, their role is to be able to take the signal on the input, amplify, raise its voltage up, typically by 29 dB, which, which happens to be 28.28 times more than the input, deliver that into a load, and then feed enough current, which is electrons, actually you know, pulling electrons out, pushing positive signals in, which you can't do, um, enough so that there's enough current to do that, whatever that needs. And so if you did the math and you said, okay, well, this is supposed to be a 250 watt amp. Uh, it's like 44 it's, volts it's RMS. 40, 44 volts. So yeah. 44 volts into eight ohms, quick, V squared over R. Mm -hmm. 44 volts, anybody have a calculator there? Yep, I got it. Oh, 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 oh Gene's calculating. So 44 I got my squared, HP. Oh, nice, a real calculator <laughs> on his phone. Work. On my yeah. phone because my HP died, and yeah. somebody told me to download the app, so I'm happy I got yeah. my HP back. So I, if that's 45 volts RMS, then you got to do the square root of two times that. It really well, gives that, you 63 volts peak, is is the kind of voltage you're getting at that rating. But that, okay. like I said, that that amp probably does okay. 300 watts. So take the square of that and divide by eight. Tell me how many amps that is. Oh, okay. So you want 44. I could, I could do that too here, but I don't have my real calculator. I have one of these things and I always make mistakes, make mistakes when I press numbers on my iPhone. Maybe it's time for a little chocolate. chocolate. <laughs> time for a wee bit of chocolate. Is it time for you. I think it's time for Uganda. You, you, Uganda. Uganda. Nice. So this we're talking about we're, we're talking about you got me you, you got me all messed up now with this chocolate. Now I don't have any chocolate here, and I'm feeling I'm feeling left out. Mm. I just got my head bourbon. Mm. <laughs> okay, Gene. All right, so you're looking at about five, almost five point six amps. That's it. Yeah. So that's a funny thing. And that's usually right fine. By the time you get to six or seven amps, you've like driven most speakers into like crazy mode. So <laughs> what you're going to do with 60 amps? Well, what they designed is an amp with lots of output devices that if you need it for a short amount of time downhill on a short, super short peak, you can deliver up to 60 amps peak without the output device going. Ah. Yep. Okay. Uh, you're never going to use that. Um, yeah. That's like having a really huge bottle of bourbon, huge, enormous and you only need to like drink for one night. Okay, so you got a gallon of bourbon. Are you going to drink all that in one night? I hope not. Um, if you're Don, you might. Don, I hope you don't drink a gallon of bourbon no, in one I night. I don't drink a gallon. That of would the you know, ambulance. Not even morning. close. <laughs> Jeans is a hater. All right, well, gonna, for they hate us. Us. They ain't us. So I actually, I almost feel Fair like alert. that question. I almost didn't feel like that question was a plant because there's a point where we're going to talk about. So thanks for your no, question. Good, good we, you need enough amps to drive the volts you need into the load you need. And in an 8-ohm load... 21 gigawatts! Gigawatts! <laughs> um, so in an 8-ohm load, that was, what did you say, 6 amps. In a 4-ohm load, that would be 12 amps. In a 2-ohm yeah. load, that would be 24 amps. Uh, so, And if you have speakers that are lower load than 2 ohms, something else is wrong. You have a bad speaker at that point. They yeah. don't know how to... Yeah, do, yeah. my experience with Parasound is they always have plenty of low... I mean, they've just got tons well, of power. Plenty of... Plenty of current. So to be fair, if any of you guys are in the car audio business that are listening to this, because Audioholics doesn't limit to theater, this thing in car audio, it's not uncommon to do really low impedance speakers yeah. so that the 12 volts you got to start with can actually yep. produce watts. Produce so, power, yeah. you know, there's no reason why you couldn't do a 0.5 ohm or 0.1 ohm speaker as long as you had an amp that could deliver into that load. 
And the funny thing about that is I learned this the hard way growing up is I would take this, the OEM speakers out of the car and put new ones in. I put some new Polks or new JBLs and they would not play loud enough with the car amp. Right. Because yeah, they were probably they were, they were speakers. Yeah. Yep. They were designed yeah, for I that system. Four ohms is the standard impedance in most car speakers. Right. So there, there are, yeah, there are some, uh, I forget who it was. Uh, it's okay to name names, right? Yeah, yeah. So I remember years ago, Bose had, you know, some speakers in some car when I worked at Dolby and their impedance was actually point, either 0.3 or 0.4 ohms. And you go, wow, that's pretty crazy. Well, you know, you're starting with 12 volts only. So with a smaller voltage swing, you can get a lot more power into 0.1 ohms as long as it's all designed for that. Yeah. So long discussion. Thank you for your question. All right. Well, let's get down to the live stream. We are in the live stream. I mean the uh, PowerPoint. Sorry. My PowerPoint. So, um, actually, Gene, any way to keep our our, our faces uh, along with uh, yes. PowerPoint? But there it is. You know, what yes. to do with specifications? Power amplifiers. There we go. So, because you want to talk with your hands, I got to talk with my hands, and and I got to see, I see, I got to see what yeah, Don's doing. Jazz hands. Jazz I got to check that Don's not going to drink a whole gallon of bourbon there. Oh, no, so I'm, I'm not monitoring. No, just three, three fingers for this. That's it. Three fingers is all it takes. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, um, so there it is. So what do all these specs mean? You know, you, you pick up a, a manufacturer spec sheet and there's all these numbers. Um, and I'm, I'm working on a committee within CEDIA, the Custom Electronics Design and Installation Association, which is all the, the, the tech heads that do custom install of high-end audio, video, theaters and stuff to come up with, you know, big thumbs up, to come up with actually a standardized specification list. No judgment, just like let's, Everybody, let's measure all the things the same way and let's put them all in the same place. So when you look at documents from different manufacturers, you can compare mm. things equally. It's called the Performance Facts Program and it's modeled in a way after the Nutritional Facts Program. You you pick up any item of food in the US or in China or in Belgium and there's these same uh, data points that can tell you whether this is good for you to eat or not. So, um, about me, do I need to introduce whatever? I have three companies. Groundy Systems makes cool speakers. PMI Engineering designs cool rooms. Sonatus Acoustics is good acoustical treatments. Gene, you're going to put some of those up in your room, I think, sometime soon. I'm planning it real soon, yes. Uh, Very I'm, good. I'm a C. I have a BS in EE, electrical engineer, just, just like Gene, right? We're both bullshitters of electrical engineering. Bullshit around electrical engineering all the time. We're going to do that today again. Uh, I spent five years at Dolby, 10 years at THX. 22 years ago, I left all of that comfort to be my own boss and have freedom to work like even late, like here. Um, so all, all together in this industry, I've had 36 years of fun and I look forward to many more of that. I'm a CEDIA fellow. I've made top instructor at CEDIA. Hey, yes, members. I got a bunch of patents. I got two kids. Um, I play guitar and saxophone. I have an airplane, a, an old British Morris 8 car, bicycles, and many other toys. I All think the coolest thing on your resume is you have an airplane. That's Tony Stark <laughs> level stuff. <laughs> and, and you're devastatingly handsome. I mean, you just don't. Ooh, baby, baby. And those two things and five bucks will buy you a cappuccino. That's right. Nice. That's right. <laughs> I, I've tried going to Starbucks and go, I have an airplane. Can I get a cappuccino? Like, sorry, dude. That's five bucks. Um, all right. So warning, this is going to get technical. This is not a kind of a soft topic where we're going to go, hey, it's good to have a nice looking app. We're, we're going to get kind of down and dirty here. So in the agenda, what are these specs for? How did they evolve? If we have time, we'll talk about like, you know, why is it that people measure this stuff this way? It's like, well, it's just sort of historically what's happened. Um, and so what are these specs? Which ones, which ones are really audible? So there's a bunch of specs you can see out there from manufacturers. I'm going to mention an example. Years ago, there was this thing called TIM, Transient Intermodulation Distortion. Do you remember those? Yes. I, and I it had was to like measure that. In, that's in phone systems. Uh, we were doing TIM stuff all the time for DSL right. communications. Yep. Right. That was a so standard. There, there is a per, no names. A person came up with the fact that that was really important in power amps, and suddenly it was all the rage to talk about that. You know, that's gone. And it's like, well. Yeah, maybe theoretically, whatever, but it was not an issue. So let's not worry about all of the specs that are not an issue. We're going to cover the things that do matter. Um, and some of the specs out there, you could academically start, you know, getting better and better numbers for the sake of specsmanship, like distortion down to 0.0001%. Yeah. Dude, once it's once you're below point, 
one, let's say, you've got a decent product, even at 0.5, you could say you don't hear it. And if you're going to start to spend a bunch of money so that the numbers keep looking better, but it doesn't improve your performance, who cares, right? And, and to add to that, I see some of these amplifiers, like the benchmark, for example, that are like 0 0.0001, like the lowest distortion amplifier on the market, which is great. I mean, on a measurement standpoint, that's awesome. But think about it, if that amp is four or $5,000, and you need a lot more power than it could provide, is it better to have that super, super low distortion amplifier that you can't hear that distortion anyway? Or is it better to get an amp that has twice the distortion, which is well below threshold, but has three or four times the power and right. you need that for your dynamics right. of your system? Right, and now we get into this like core issue of engineering, which is there is no perfect engineering. There's engineering to a set of compromises. You know, it's a, right. the best engineering is the one where you've looked at all the things you got to worry about and, and gotten the best compromise. So. If you need enough output voltage and power to drive all of your speakers to get to a certain sound pressure level and uh, and you can get good low enough distortion, go for that. If you go, well, you know, I don't really need that much sound pressure level. I don't like to listen very loud, but I like the theory of keeping a, having a design that's completely transparent. Why not spend the money on a super, super low distortion amplifier, even though that may not make a difference or whatever. You know? mm -hmm. So which ones cost that's not a typo, Mucho Dolores. Um, so Dolores or Dolores actually is like, like I call it, which is pain uh, dollars. Like sometimes you're paying money for things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. So what's an amp to do? So this is a little bit of electrical engineering. Ready, ready, ready. So an amp is normally shown as a triangle, you know, sort of the, the in, the, in the engineering specs that, that, that triangle represents a, a thing that a signal goes in and it comes out with more, um, either voltage or current or both. So you could have a voltage amplifier that doesn't amplify current. That's not a power amp. It's just a voltage amp. You could have an, you can have a uh, an amplifier that in, increases amperes without uh, current without changing uh, voltage. That's not a power amp. That's an, that's a um, transconductance amplifier. Um, or you have what we're interested in, which is a, a device in which you can put a hundred millivolts in on the uh, on the input, which would be the typical level coming off a, mm -hmm. a preamp or a processor, or some you know regular source device. Um, this little thing that looks like a little lollipop is actually the power supply. There's there's actually DC volts controlling all this, maybe plus and minus fifty volts or sixty volts, whatever. Um, and then on the output, most amplifiers are going to turn a hundred millivolts into two point eight volts. That's a really common gain. It's a yep. gain of twenty eight. Um, it's actually 28.28 and it's 29 decibels if you do the math of that. And that thing needs to drive a load. And the load can be modeled as a resistor, but a res resistor that has a little arrow on it that changes with frequency. It's a variable resistor. Very, very few speakers that are declared as eight ohms really are eight ohms. That means that the average uh, is eight ohms or that the minimum is no less than 6.4 ohms, by the way, by, by law but they yep. change with frequency. So an amplifier has to amplify voltage. It needs to amplify current. By the way, the, the current going in here is microamps, nothing. But you need to deliver enough current so that whatever this voltage is, you can drive this load. And we just did a quick calculation of what it takes to do a 250 watt amplifier into a eight ohm load. You found that was six amps, right, Gene? Uh, it was like it was like five or something. Yeah, five, something like that, five, five point five, something. Five yeah. amps. If it was a four ohm load, it'd be 10 or 11 amps. If it was a yeah. two ohm load, it'd be 20, 22 amps, um, which is 22 amps is pretty significant. Anyway, because it amplifies both voltage and current, it's a power amp. That's sort of where that word came from, you know, like the history, because it, it on the way in, it's funny, there's no power going in, it's voltage, but you're turning it into something that has volts and also can drive a lot of electrons down here, which is current. It's called a power amp. Um, now, along the way, that thing, should not change the signal in any other way. It should just change the voltage from 100 millivolts to 2.8 volts and the current from microamps into 5, 10, 20 amps and nothing else. Whatever you put in should come out without any change. And that's the ideal amplifier. And all amplifiers are going to change it a little bit. So question number one is, where did this 100 millivolt become 2.8 volts? Who decided that? What rule, you know, which Moses came down the, the, the mountain and said, it will be 28 mm -hmm. Uh, 28 X or 29 DB again. 29. Yeah. That, I know. Where does that I know from? that came. I know it came from THX original. Uh, I think. No, originally. Long, oh, we, we decades way before. Way before. That. Yeah. But decades before that. So I know it works. <laughs> so 
it's just one of those things, like they say in that jazz song, just one of those things. Um, so first of all, what's 2.8 volts? It happens to be one watt into an eight ohm load. Right. Okay. Um, and somewhere along the way, it was sort of convenient to decide that the, when the input is full swing, um, the output would be full, excuse me, when, when one volt is on the input, the output should be full swing. So a hundred watt amplifier at full swing puts out 28 volts. Right. And years ago, years ago, years ago, and, and you know, there's pioneers, pioneers in the industry, like people who made these things way in the beginning when there's like nobody doing these webinars, maybe it was like, I think I want to make a thing that when I stick one volt in, it puts out a hundred watts and I'm going to propose this to my buddies in the industry and we're all going to agree to it. So an agreement from, I'm going to say 40 years ago, 45 years ago, a standard, a, a practice was that an amplifier would have enough gain so that one volt on the input caused clip on the output or was right on the edge of clip. So a hundred watt, watt amplifier, amp yeah. One volt goes in, 28 volt goes out. If you go to 1.1, you're clipping the output. Clipping means it, con it can't go no more. Instead of a wave being nice and even, the top is chopped off like right at the head and at the chin. Um, and a 200 watt amp or 200, 200 watt amp, is, which is around 40 volts, man, I'm having a blank on that. Mm -hmm. One volt in would put out 40 volts out. Um, 200 watt amp. 3db higher something like that um and so on and so forth who decided that i know some people i'm, I'm sure there's somebody who's listening goes oh that was blah 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 who came up with that well you know, I, I think part that. of it is too is if you put too much gain you get you amplify noise so maybe that was a correct. happy medium correct you know, absolutely you got, yeah you got so, thermal noise and you got gain noise so the idea was can we make a pre-amplifier that doesn't have to have a really big big uh, power supply that you can put out enough voltage. So in the gain structure, the next thing doesn't have to have too much gain. And it was just sort of a, a nice, easy, yeah. uh, convenient thing. And yeah, if you had a gain, oh, by the way, there's no reason and uh, other than noise, there's no reason an amplifier could not put up, put in hundred millivolts and put out 10 volts. Right. And there are yeah. some amps that have gain controls on them. You can crank all the way up and they will do that. But what happens then is your preamp, your device before, you're going to keep the volume very low. You'll never be able to turn it up to 11. So uh, a quick funny story about that. When I worked at Raytheon back in the day, I had to design a headset coupler that would take the Plantronics headset, which I hate mm -hmm. that freaking thing because of, because of how antiquated it was. And it would amplify the signal loud enough to work in this antiquated Plantronics headset. The gain circuit had to be a gain of 4,000. You know how hard it is to make a gain that high without causing oscillation? Yikes. I had to do crazy shit so that thing wouldn't oscillate. I could sneeze and it would oscillate. And, yeah. and it was noisy, so I had to use active gain control to cut down the noise. Yeah. So there comes a point, and that's beyond what we're doing here, but just yeah. to let people know that if you add more voltage gain, that's not necessarily a good thing because it yeah. amplifies noise. And if right. you have a high sensitive speaker, you're going to hear hiss. You're going to hear hiss. So this this number, uh, uh, this number, I just want to bring up that some legacies came up with the fact that this is a convenient number, and that's what you'll find. Now, in the THX days, uh, when you know Holman and I were working on this thing, we was like, yeah, let's just make a hundred watt amp be the gain of a hundred watt amp. So gain of twenty eight, and let's put everybody on the same footing. There's a slight change, which is that rather than change the gain with the power of the amplifier it's always the same gain so that when you're going in the speaker always plays the right reference level a 200 watt amp would just play louder it would allow you to go up higher mm -hmm. uh, but without changing the volume knob so uh that's that's what an amp's got to do and along the way it may as well be reliable you know you don't want the thing breaking down all the time because you know you know when it's going to break down right when is it going to break down when you have guests over and you're, and you're demoing Correct. After you've drunk that gallon of, of Friday, Friday afternoon. I, I can tell you exactly when it breaks down. Friday evening after everybody's went home. That's Friday exactly. evening. Yep, exactly. So Friday uh, after everybody, after all of Don's people have gone home. But when 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 you guys are wanting to play it, you you know, have a few drinks with your buddies, you crank it up, that's when it's going to like fry. And then Don has to answer the call and run over there. To well, fix. yeah, yeah. So listen, right. I just want to say, Anthony, when you're like, oh, when I was working with Holman, I mean, that's like the coolest thing ever, dude. Like, you just <laughs> casually say that. I mean, to an audio video nerd, that's like, oh, wow. 
Yeah. So quick, we got a super chat from Isaac is asking, tell us about loaded variant amps that are five to seven channels. Yeah. Well, I mean, most class AB amps, good ones are loaded variant. That's the advantage they had over class D for many years. But now we're seeing really good state-of-the-art class D amplifiers, whether it's a Purify amplifier from Bruno Putzi's, the Hypix ones, um, even the latest ICE modules, Pascal, those are all pretty much load invariant amps these days, meaning that no matter what load it's driving, the frequency response of the amp remains the same, which is right. a good thing. That right. way it's always consistent. And so when, when you're saying load invariant, do you mean that whether you're doing one or five channels driven, it's, it can always deliver 200, 200 watts? Um, oh, I thought he meant that the frequency mean, response. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and it could be both, right? Yeah, um, that's a good point. So yeah, the yeah. power supply could give a tax down for sure. And that's, it, it, if you want a five channel amp that can deliver 100 watts, you know, out of five at the same time, the power supply needs to be 500 watts, which isn't that big, but if- Well, if no, it needs, to be to, it needs to be a lot bigger than that. If it's a class AB amp, it's gotta be at least double AB, that. Yeah. Yep. yeah so um so th that actually, is actually actually this takes this this takes things off topic but it's important to mention the power consumption rating on the back of a receiver when you see when you buy a yamaha receiver and it says you know 600 watts and then people ridicule it saying well how could it be 600 watts when it's 100 times 11. well they don't rate it with all the channels driven at full power they actually rate it with all the channels at one eighth power because one eighth power is the most inefficient way to drive an amplifier and that's putting it at like 25% efficient instead of 70% efficient when you're driving it near clipping. So those power consumption readings on the back panel, unless it says max power, are not really max power. Right. And you have to design an amplifier. So you have to design an amplifier that not only could deliver max power, but also deliver sustained power at lower levels and not go into thermal runaway. Right. Because at the lower levels for class AB, it's very inefficient. And that's the huge advantage of class D why we should really be moving to class D because if you have a high channel density of an Atmos system, 12, 13 to 26 channels, we got to stop using class AB because that right. shit is just idling power all day long and it's a space heater. And we right. need to move to something that's 90% efficient, even at low power. Yeah. So, so the next thing on here was not B, space heater. I think <laughs> I forgot an A. Yeah. So That's this, serendipity right there. The conversation is going great. By the way, if you guys ever think we have this prepared, we don't. This is I, I love these webinars because it's it's really a bunch of people chatting. Um, and sometimes we'll disagree. We'll agree to disagree. Sometimes it's just like, yeah, yeah, we're you know, we're all going down the, the same place. So let me talk a little bit about this heat stuff. So when an amplifier is rated in terms of, of its power, there's an interesting regulation in the United States. Other countries may not be the same, but in the United States, you need to show the the uh, either UL, the FTC, you know, standards bodies mm -hmm. that wh whatever you say this thing can do, it can do it without thermally overheating at an eighth of that power. So the test isn't actually crank it up to 100 watts or 200 watts or 300 watts. It's actually to say, okay, my amp goes to 200 watts to, you know, to whatever, 40 volts output. They check that that's the clipping and then they turn it down to one eighth and you got to show that you can sustain that one channel driven, five channels driven, eight channel, whatever it is, yep. without overheating. And that's what Gene is saying. How How is it that you overheat at an eighth power? What What's the deal? So let me really quickly with this diagram, without getting into a lecture on power amp design, show you how that works. So when you're at clip of an amplifier, when you put, let's just say, let's keep talking about a hundred watt amplifier. When you're putting a volt in and you're getting 28 volts out, the swing over here is essentially unattenuated by the output transistors. Essentially, you're going in, you're amplifying it, and everything from the power supply is essentially going straight out. Not everything, actually, a good portion of it. <clears throat> when you reduce the signal, when you go lower, the only way that gets lower is the transistors are choking that signal. The output devices are told by their by the base controls of them. It's like, okay, well, attenuate that that supply that may, may be plus and minus 40 volts. That's always going in on a regular class AB amp. And the output devices, the output transistors are pulling that down so you get some lower value. It turns out that the, you know, if you did a heat bell curve, when there's low voltage coming out of the amp, there's not a lot of heat. When there's high voltage coming out, not a lot of heat. It's like there's this plate in between, which is usually at an eighth of the rated power that the thing is really cooking. 
And it turns oh, out little... that most program material, when you crank it up, the peaks are here and the average is somewhere between one tenth to one eighth. So, so I'm going to pull up a measurement for you. Keep talking. I want, I yeah. want to show you something that's interesting. So this business about being a space heater is relevant. And, and like when, when you're looking at the power consumption coming out of the wall, it doesn't always match what you're pushing out into the speakers. Um, class D amplifiers work completely differently. The, the middle part is the same, but the power supply is actually modulating up and down with the signal. There's actually a little you know, a little detector circuits looking at the signal going through and changing the power supply so that it can track together with the output. So you're never syncing that much. Um, the output devices are not working like giant resistors, like brakes. You know, so imagine you're driving your car. You got a foot on the accelerator, a foot on the brake to get it to stay at 50 miles per hour. That's a great way to burn up your brakes and use up a lot of gas. Yeah. So instead, you, you have a thing called an accelerator, you pull back on that, and, and that's the rails on a Class D amplifier that are way more efficient. If it's designed well, it sounds great. Okay. You see the, you see the chart I put up here? Yeah. This is why at 1 8th power, a Class AB amplifier is tortured right here. Yeah. You're, you're down here to the 20% efficiency rating, whereas a Class D, even at 1 8th power driven, is almost is over 80% efficient. Right. Much different, much different scenario, right. especially when you have 11 to 13 or more channels. Right. So what are the benefits of that added efficiency is less heat, less power consumption out of the wall. So greener, if you want to think of it that way, you're not, you know, wasting a bunch of energy. Longevity. Longevity. The, the devices don't always blow up and and potentially a more dynamic sound character because, you, you know, you're not overheating these devices and the heat, the hotter they get, the less they have the ability to put out current, stuff like that. So... Um, now, I'll just mention this, and we're, we're going to come back to talk about that. It used to be that Class D amps did not sound that good. Agreed. That's over. Okay, I've listened to a lot of manufacturers' Class D amp topologies against really well-known Class A and Class AB amplifiers, you know, sort of the darlings of the industry, and it's like, man, it sounds every bit as good, which is amazing. Agreed. Yep. There was a question earlier. Of somebody asked if uh, eventually most receivers will be Class D. And I responded, probably, most likely, that's where it's going to go. Yeah, so there's two reasons why they're not all Class D right now. And the biggest one that I understand from the Japanese manufacturers I spoke to is it's all about perception. Um, for years, audiophiles would not go anything but Class A, right? Yeah. It, now, Class AB is the new Class A. Like, that's the old style. That's the purest amplifier you can get with a high bias into Class A. Class AB is the benchmark. It's going to take years for really for people to adapt the fact that you can get as good sound at Class D. The other thing is it costs more money to make good Class D over a Class AB design, and that's mostly because of the power supply. Because you could throw a linear supply on a Class D amp, which a lot of manufacturers do, and there's some advantages to that because you get tend to have more headroom out of a big supply like that but it's not as efficient as doing a really good SMPS, regulated SMPS. That's the only time you want to regulate a power supply is when it's an SMPS, not a linear, because a linear will dissipate too much power through the regulators to do that. Right. But an SMPS is a totally different ball game. The best class D amplifiers use SMPS regulated, and you're right. not going to get that in a $500 receiver. Right. Well, let's see if we can change that perception. You know, there's another people. There's enough people listening, watching, and hearing that may trust us. They certainly trust Don. Okay. Oh, and, well, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, to just go, dude, stop worrying about that. Well, well, our, in our integration amps now, you know, since they're not necessarily a mainstream product, mm -hmm. are all switching like that triad. That uses yeah, that's, a, that's a great amp. I mean, I, I mean, it's it's a one U, and it has sixteen channels of amplification at yeah. fifty watts a channel. Bridgeable, and, bridgeable, know, right. bridgeable. Yeah, hundred watts and four ohms. It's a that's that's a mainstay now so it's right. just a matter of time i think till your mainstream receivers go that way in fact i've i've heard a rumor that the new integra receivers when they eventually come out their flagship models will all be class d right. I trust told. don he's the only one drinking <laughs> just three fingers man <laughs> the shocker right oh so you're hearing the integra ones are going class d i didn't hear that but i heard in their flagship models well yeah. that makes sense because pioneer is is class d so well, they're, pioneer, yeah know, yeah yep they're yeah. basically the same thing so so i use a, a, there's this brand called powersoft again I, I hope it's okay to mention brands powersoft yeah. is the darling of the pro audio industry you know they're they're like the one that everybody like respects and it's all it's all a, a fancy version 
uh, of digital switching class D amplifiers that are very well designed, man, those things sound amazing. Um, and, you know, and I, I recently had an installation. Um, actually, I think I covered this in a residential systems article, uh, an installation where they, the client had an audiophile amp, wasn't sounding that good. They badly needed equalization to get over some acoustical issues in the room. And we proposed to switch from this, I will go unnamed, audiophile expensive class A amplifier to a one U high class two channel class D with EQ. And mm could equalize the things, tune things, tune in both the, the time and frequency domain, get everything to be time aligned, correct, all the stuff you do when you're doing a good job. And I was like, okay, well, listen to this. And I'm like, oh my God, that's a million times better. And there it is, a, a made for pro and commercial application switching supply class D amplifier that sounds amazing. So, oh. you know, if there's this one thing we, you know, my hope is that if in the slide screen we can convince anybody out there is like, look at class D amps and stop worrying about what used to be a problem in the past. So, but okay. people still like that look at the big monster amps, though. So you'll you'll sure. they'll make giant chassis with this little sure. bit of circuitry in the bottom of them. Sure, you can do that. Add some weights in there to make it work. Yeah. Um, so, um, all right, we're. We're 40 minutes into this. I, I was telling Gene, we're probably going to take two or three sessions to get through this. And and if it's okay, it's okay. I think I, I'm really liking the fact that we're bantering and having the time. And, um, and I, I did wish I had a drink. I'm, I'm pretending to drink out of my USB speaker. Is that like, well, it was going to be wine, either wine or bourbon. I was, you know, it sounds like a bourbon night. It's so. time for bourbon. It's uh, time. It, you know, after 9 p.m. wines, it's, it's over, man. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, I what I... What I did next is I actually um, oh there's a there's a little typo on here they, there's a there's a bunch of specifications I'm going to go out uh, go over and uh, ignore this thing at the top I, I've got this for our discussion categorized first into the issues that affect power and we've already talked about it then there's a bunch of specs I think that affect sound quality regardless of power regardless so of there's a good question that always comes up for the objectivist and I'm. Yeah. I, I'm somewhat of an objectivist, but I know that I can't always explain everything that's going on and, and what I hear because of psychoacoustics and stuff, but shouldn't all amps sound the same after a certain point? So in other words, if you have amp A that's delivering 100 watts a channel at, at a distortion threshold that's below detectability versus amp B that's delivering the same power and has a distortion that's really low, shouldn't they sound identical? The, the textbook answer should be yes, but it's always a little bit more complicated than that. What do it, you think about that, Anthony? It, it is a bit more complicated. And actually, there was a great article from a really long time ago in, uh, I, I guess, it, I guess it was either Stereo Review, I forget, um, that actually addressed this question and talked about, you know, what what is audible and not. And I'm going to go through that. Like, what are audible things? And and here are the 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 to an extent they should sound the same. However. Different amps have a different output impedance and different speakers have different impedances. And the interaction between the output impedance of, of an amplifier, and I'll explain that a little later, and the speaker load will mean that um, a certain speaker may sound different with different amps. An easy mm -hmm. speaker to drive that has a load that's nice and smooth and pretty high impedance, I would challenge most people to hear the difference, differences between amplifiers. Especially if um, they have high sensitivity. If they're pretty high high sensitivity, so you're staying away from clips. So there's a few things yeah. that I notice. They're like, man, I can really hear the differences. So one of them, output impedance of the amp. And it's not that hard to have a really relatively low output impedance. But if you have some speakers, like some, some of the audiophile speakers out there, they don't worry so much about the sensitivity or the impedance curves. Um, mm -hmm. Those can be a little harder to drive. And you will hear the differences sonically between an amplifier with a high output impedance and a low output impedance. And I have a I have a chart coming up later that explains why. It's actually gonna change the net frequency response. One thing, second thing, pardon me, is different amplifiers recover from clip differently. As right. in once you push them a little hard, you know, they're gonna clip. Like the top little things that you don't really hear, like they're really short clips on little dynamic things. But some of them, once they clip, they stay clip for a little while, they stick. The output devices are in, in saturation, like heavily saturated, and then they st they stay actually on, even though the signals come back down. So they stay clipped. So it's like one a hysteresis. Amplifier must, sorry, hist it's, it's like it's like a hysteresis. Is hysteresis. Yeah. It just takes a while for the dip, the base depletion zone to fill back in to get really you know precise about this. And so, 
two different amplifiers on a speaker that when you crank it up a little bit, and that's where you said sensitivity matters. If you have a speaker with relatively low sensitivity, like 80 or 82, like some of the speakers out there, because they really fussed with the frequency response to get it really smooth, the sensitivity is low, you're going to be clipping the amp. And when you when you play a little loud, you'll notice that, you know, one sounds clean and the other one just sounds a little harsh. And it's just one has a harsher clipping character. So I'll give you a quick anecdotal story about that. I Years ago, I measured this pint-sized Class D amplifier. I think the brand was IQ Audio or something. I'm not even sure if they're in business anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I measured the amplifier, and it was one of the first load and variant Class D amps I've ever measured. Like it, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my God, this thing measures the same under any output impedance. It's put out 150 watts RMS at 8 ohms or continuous. And I'm like, I want to put this on my status acoustic AT speakers, which are those $50,000 RBH speakers. They dip down to like three ohms in the bass mm -hmm. frequencies. I wanted to see how mm -hmm. it sounded compared to my Emotiva XPR1 monoblocks, which are two mm -hmm. kilowatt amps. Mm -hmm. And I did my best to level match. And I had, you know, somebody switching it for me. So I wasn't as, you know, biased, biased by figuring yeah. out which amp was. I could always tell when I was listening to the, um, the Class D amplifier. And the reason why is when I heard transients, like I put on Miles Davis and I was listening to saxophone transients, or I was listening to kick drum transients, it sounded softer on the Class D. And then when mm -hmm. I went and started doing dynamic tests using burst tests on my audio precision, I saw it was a clipping circuit that was not distorting the amp, it was just uh, making the signal smaller so mm -hmm. it wouldn't clip. Mm -hmm. And I could hear that when I was listening to it on a relatively high sensitivity speaker, a 90 dB sensitive speaker, but because it was dipping into the three ohm range, it was causing that circuitry to, to trip more readily than right. the Emotiva amp, which could drive a fork. Right. <laughs> um, so so those are, broke, those are yeah. conditions. <laughs> and if you had turned it down, right, by six dB or so, you may not hear the difference, but right. then it won't really sound like you expect a saxophone to sound, which is a pretty yes. loud instrument. I play saxophone and Dude, when I was practicing saxophone in college, I had to go hide in the closet so people wouldn't like yell at me. Yep. So, um, yeah, there are things that are, you can call them functional. Sometimes I call them good behavior that cause differences in audibilities of amplifier, even though all of the specs seem uh, identical. And there's a way to build a spec book that says, I'm going to be able to see what those differences are. That's mm -hmm. a great question. So someone super chatted us, um, Isaac, I don't think I have an answer for you here. I'm not too familiar with Heigl products. I know that they are revered by audiophiles. Uh, Anthony, have you ever installed any Heigl products? Uh, no, Don? Um, I haven't. Well, Isaac. I haven't installed it, but I've heard quite a bit of it. And it sounds absolutely fantastic. I think you heard some of it with some Dyn Audio at the audio show a couple of years ago, Gene. Oh, movie. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that it's was actually good. a great product. I mean, I love the sound of it. Actually, so we gotta we gotta probably get those on the bench test one of these days and yeah. see what's going on there. Well, actually, uh, I think Mike um, is the rep, the one that's the James rep. I oh, gotcha. I think nice. he's the rep for that too. So yeah, so that that could be in the works for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm actually looking uh, at Hegel, and you know, hey, one of our local dealers is a, is a dealer for it. So I'll go check it out. Thanks for bringing that up. Really good um, sounding stuff. So yeah, so those are good questions. What is it that makes people like those? So. There's this other thing that we have to agree. I hope we don't agree to disagree is that beyond all the measurements and all the specs, and there's this thing that's like, Perception. I don't know, I feel better with this one. Can't explain. I, I, I bump into that once in a while. So sometimes it's your eyes listening. So yeah. this this is the look of a Hegel lamp, you know. Um, no, oh, you can't see it. Beautiful. It's a yeah. Nice, big, beautiful like, thing. So It's like adding upgraded power cords, right? right? Yeah. If it's beautiful, it's going to sound better. So you can't listen with that. Okay. Can't For be sure. Uh, but I, I, years ago, I, I, I tested this crazy high-end expensive, expensive phono preamp, turntable preamp, designed by Russian nuclear scientists and built on chassis using old <laughs> missiles that had been recycled. This thing was like <laughs> a cool. tank. The Chernobyl amp, yeah. The Chernobyl amp. It was like this preamplifier was like built on a marble base, all this stuff. So I tried to ignore all that stuff and, and you know, ran a bunch of audio precision tests. And like the thing was amazing. It was beautifully designed. All the tests were great. This, this thing had, this is a phono preamp. It could put out 20 volts. Why? Because the power supply was 400 volts. You don't need that in a photo preamp. Just a photo yeah. preamp, right? You connect your turntable to it, and the output goes to a, pre a preamplifier. And do all that aside, and then I listen to it. It's like, dude, it just sounded amazing. What can I say? 
uh, be beyond what all, you know, it should have been neutral and no better than somebody else's decent sound phono preamp. It just sounded amazing. End of story. And that does happen. And I, you know, everybody wishes they could completely understand all of those things. Uh, and one day we will understand those, you know, every year that goes by, we all learn a little bit more the, yeah. the, the correlation <clears throat> between what the needles say and what our ears perceive. So, so, so I, back I in the Back in the day, Don and Don can relate to this because we kind of came from the same era of Circuit City, you know, with all the different receivers they had in the rooms. Man, I'm telling you, the best sounding receivers at Circuit City were always Ankyo and Harmon Carden, by yeah. far, by yeah. far. And that that Ankyo 929, that freaking thing the was like yeah, the THX, yeah, that, or the 919. Balls to the wall, man. That thing was heavy. You couldn't pick it up, and yeah. just not listening to it, just looking at it, you knew that was the best receiver in but, the room. But you needed the uh, ED901 AC3 processor to go with it. If you really <laughs> you did. DB25. Don, yeah. anecdotally, I worked on that product for a long time. With Did you really? It was, a, there, was, it. there was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of sweat went into making that thing really, really good. And I had, I had, awesome. eight, I had the 828 THX because I was poor. Then the yep. 8901 processor with that ribbon cable that connected to it. And I can, and I had a pioneer laser displayer and I was the man, you know, that was, was like 1996, yeah. 95, yeah. 96. You're right. That that was a good product. That was a good product. That you great know, product just, actually. And you know, was it perception because you couldn't pick it up because it had a nice faceplate? You know, the 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 machining, the milling of it was really That's nice. So cool, man! I didn't know Who you knows? were. That's awesome. Who knows? Yeah. Um. So, Gene, it looks like we're 51 minutes into this, or maybe a little bit less. How much more yeah. do we go? Do we do we move this to a, a future session? Or do we just uh, do the, this first thing, which is the we have three, three we have 300 people. Bird. We have 300 people in here at midnight. Crazy. So I go, I say, let's go another, let's go another five or 10 minutes. Sounds great. Thank you guys for listening. I'm, I'm always amazed that you guys will, will stick through this for, for as long as you do. And then I, I also get pings from people that are international. So like there's people for who this is four in the morning or six in the morning. Yeah. Right. Wow. You guys really love this. I, I, it, it is even, such an even honor. The Dragon Miss guy who's a smart ass. I still like him too. Or girl. <laughs> I don't know. Can't tell, you know, Dragon Miss. Um, so power related specs. So I've grouped these things into, you know, how much grunt do you get? And I'm going to start with something that you'll never actually see somebody. I shouldn't say never. You will rarely see somebody give you this data. And I'm actually on a little bit of a mission to change that. And there's a bunch of people within the CD sphere that are like, yeah, um, including app designers. Like, yeah, I wish we could define this, th this thing way. So first thing I want to say that's important is how many volts can this device push to your speaker both long-term and short-term and over the range of typical impedances? This could be a really easy thing for manufacturers to disclose. It's mm -hmm. related back to watts, which I'll bring back in a second, but it's a lot easier if, imagine a world, imagine, I have a dream where speakers are actually defined in input voltage and, uh, and maximum voltage capability. Right now they're defined in sensitivity, which is that when you have 2.8 volts going in, you get those so loud. If you happen mm. to know that that's one watt, but what if the speaker's four ohms, not eight ohms? It gets and it's two watts. You can start to go like this is really complicated. Yeah. I'm scratching my head. So, I have a stream that will switch from from watts to volts. So, what matters in a power amp is how many volts can it put out. Some amplifiers have a big, very big difference between long term and short term, and that has to do with a bunch of different things: the power supply, the thermal, the this, the that. I'm not going to get into it, but um, and then. What is that output voltage over a range of loads? So some speakers may dip down to two ohms. Some speakers may dip down to eight ohms. You know, they may average around 12 or 13 ohms and dip down to, to eight ohms. That would be more like a pro side. So that's a spec that if you can see it on somebody's spec sheet, if you actually see somebody giving you that, you should go, okay, this person's really honest. This person's on it and they're honest. I should pay mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. So the next thing that relates to it, which is more traditional, is the power output capability, also sometimes shown in long term and short term, although most cases, they're just telling you what in the US, what UL, Underwriters Lab, and FTC, the Fair, Fair Trade Commission, spec, which is if you say it's 100 watts into 8 ohms, you got to be able to play at an eighth of that forever without overheating. Yeah. And what is so, the and, and in some cases when they enforce anything though they never enforce anything. No, there's no enforcing with FTC at all. Anymore. 
Uh, there, there used to be, and and if anybody actually doubts it, you can actually report it back to the FTC, and they will run tests or ask the well, manufacturer to test. The it FTC with the FTC was closing that ruling down, and we partitioned them uh, on YouTube, and we got over two, like twenty five hundred signatures to keep the FTC ruling in place. Yeah, we flooded the FTC website with people saying, "Don't do it. Don't don't, don't yeah, do away don't with get it. Rid of it." Yeah. So a quick anecdotal story. I have another. I'm Mr. Anecdote tonight. I love it. I'm the usually okay. the guy who's anecdotal. Go for I it. I know. I'm taking. I'm filling your shoes now. So I recently reviewed a Den in 80 watt per channel integrated amp, the A110. The thing weighs like 60 pounds. It's 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 110th anniversary. They're only building it for one year. It's built in the Shirakawa factory in Japan. It's a it's a engineering marvel when you look at how this thing is constructed, right? So when I posted this on the website, people are like, "It's only 80 watts a channel." My my $500 Den and receiver is 100 watts a channel. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Your 100 watt per channel den and receiver can deliver 100 watts, yeah. you know, for maybe a few seconds before the protection circuits kick in. I was running 80 watts on this den, and I forgot to turn off the uh, audio precision on the test signal. It was running for a good 10 or 15 minutes, and I touched the top of the of the uh, cover, and it was warm. That it wasn't burning up. If that was an right. AVR, that would have been burning up. Be really hot. And yeah. this thing could double down with having load impedance. I got three hundred and something watts out of it in two ohms. You can't yeah. get that with a five hundred dollar receiver. Yep. Yeah. So right there, when you're talking about long term, if you think about it, the review industry does everything with sweep tones, usually at one kilohertz, and that's just an instantaneous. That's like a zero to sixty time on a perfect track with no wind resistance or anything like that. And for for years, when Class D amplifiers first came out. The, all the magazines were only testing them at one kilohertz. And what happened when you took an ICE amplifier and drove a four ohm load, if you went above three kilohertz, the amp would cut into a third of power because of the post fil filter feedback couldn't handle the lower, the higher current demands of uh, low impedance loads. Mm. And it was always missed by the magazines until we started doing full bandwidth measurements on it. And this is why we do need, we need not only do we need long-term and short-term, but we need full bandwidth, not one kilohertz crap. Because you really need to know how that amplifier behaves at the low frequencies. And more importantly, the, the high frequencies are the ones that are more challenging uh, usually than the low frequencies because you have slew rate induced distortions and other things. And if you're doing a class D, if the switching supply, if the switching frequency is not high enough, you start seeing unusual behavior around 20 kilohertz. Yeah, some funny intermodulation. So um, so this this number, this power output capability is a traditional thing, and it and it is actually, I'll just say it's marred into legality. So you don't really know what it means. Mm. Somebody's 80 watts could actually have more output voltage and somebody's 120 watts because it it's all about some thermal, some guarantee that thermally the thing will work. And so we can't change it. Let's, let's keep power output, but let's also tell people what is the output voltage capability of this thing into these loads, long-term and short-term, regardless of thermal. Like, what can this thing put out into a four ohm load across the frequency range? And I'm going to get to that, like the power bandwidth of the thing. And that would be really interesting. And you can relate that back to what your speaker needs in terms of volts and relate it in terms of current to what's the load. So there are a few people who talk about voltage swing capabilities. There's a few amps out there in the commercial and pro side. Everybody else is still living in this power business and it's confusing. Well, so, let me ask you this, Anthony. Let me play the devil's advocate. Yeah. Would it be easier to do what they do in the computer industry, where they, when you buy a computer, you buy it with a power supply and it tells you how many watts the power supply is. That way you know you could drive your video cards and all your other cards in that computer. Why not have a power supply rating say, this is the max capability of that power supply. So you really know what that amplifier could do when it's driving one channel, five channels, seven channels, whatever. If you know the max power supply capability, even over a specified amount of time, whether it's a second or a minute, would that not be the easier that's path? A, that's an interesting thing. Um, it would get, I think if everybody's on the same footing on that and the loads are all resistive, uh, that may be good, but but speakers are not resistors. They have power factors. There's different um, efficiencies of different amplifiers. So given the same thing, um, so anecdotally, I'm gonna go back to PowerSoft. They, they have a new series of amps in which they give you a, the model number. The, they have a 300 series and a 600 series, and they're basically saying, here's a brick that you can buy as a two-channel or a four-channel device. It can put out 300 watts. 
Mm -hmm. If you just drive one one output, it'll get 300 watts out of one output. If you drive all you know two outputs, you get 150 watts. If you drive all four at the same time, you get 75. But basically, it's thinking the like the switch. power brick, the actual power supply that's feeding electrons out. Um, can deliver just like you said on a computer. It can do up to three hundred watts. However, you're going to use it. So that's an. In I, I like that. I like that. That's that's cool. Um, and um, that would be more useful. But then you would, if you don't also know what's the capability of a single output, because that has to do with the uh, the, the actual devices. Uh, you you need both. You actually need to understand what a single well, single output can do and what all of them driven can you, do. You you kind of do know that because the, here's what's happening with the receiver industry. They used to give you two channels driven full bandwidth power. Right, right. Now they're since Atmos came out, now they're giving you one channel driven at ten percent distortion at six ohms, so they can inflate it. It's almost a two and a half time increase over its eight ohm full bandwidth low distortion rating. Right. So you do kind of know the max, and I and I and I could simulate how they're doing these tests now. It's just it's an instantaneous test at one kilohertz, ten percent at six ohms, and that's the max that 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 that, yeah. that receiver could deliver for one channel driven. Right, and you don't. So want we kind of already have that data. What's that? Yeah, yeah. You don't yeah. want to listen at that point. So the other thing that some manufacturers give you, and and that question, uh, I almost feel like it was a plant about the um, the Parasound amp is some manufacturers tell you the maximum output current, and it's like. Do you need that? Well, it's kind of, you know, it may be nice to know that, hey, this thing is designed like with tons and tons of current headroom. If it needed, it could deliver 60 amps. You're never going to use it. Um, but if you actually just do a little bit of math or you just want the number, you know, this is this is sort of same as above, really, uh, except that I want to keep saying that the power output capability, if you follow the letter of the law, is under certain conditions and doesn't really tell you um, by law, exactly what this thing can do really in terms of being able to drive your speaker to the peak levels you need so you can enjoy a saxophone, a, a drum, anything that's, you know, triple forte on a piano, which is, you know, big loud peaks. You don't really know from this be because of the way it's supposed to be measured. Um, so um, what's interesting about my slide over here is nobody's telling you, or say very few people are giving you this maximum output voltage. Everybody's giving you this under conditions that are widely variable and some people are giving you current. So what do you do with all that? You ask, you know, um, you, you, if you're looking at an amp and you're like, I, you know, I'm really interested in this amp. There's something I like about it. You know, the, the dealer that sells it, I really like whatever the price, pick up the phone and ask to talk to engineering at the manufacturer. You'd be surprised, you know, they'll answer. They'll put you through and you'll talk no, to somebody no, that would love to geek out about it for a while. Maybe not yeah. in Shirakawa. That may be difficult to get a hold of somebody over there. <laughs> um, but um, you may you may find somebody that can give you those numbers. Yeah. I mean, some the one of the there's a bunch of problems with the consumers buy on specs and they don't really understand specs. Then you combine that with manufacturers that have somewhat misleading specs or adjusted specs where people just get, do an overview of it. Then you move into the forums and all the people who think they're in the know. And then there's all this misinformation that's out there. Um, that's what drew me to Audioholics years ago was, was the, the comprehensive measurements that they did on everything versus even some of the other review companies out there. Um, and it's, and it's sad because people just don't know what to buy. You know, right. unless they can find somebody trusted like an integrator or a retail store that has listened to these products with multitude of speakers and a multitude of environments. So this is great information. And I thank both of you for bringing this to, to the public. No, oh, you're, you're welcome. So I would say listen to Gene. Gene measures these things, you know, the, the awesome. same way that any decent engineer would measure them. Um, he's an engineer, don't forget. Um, and uh, so, you know, so look at the reviews there. Um, Look forward in the next, I'd say the next six months to this thing that we're doing with Encedia, where you're going to actually start to see these Cedia uh, sanctioned spec disclosures that go into some of these pieces of info that don't, uh, that are not marred by some legacies of, well, this is how it's always been done. So we're going to keep doing this. It's funny, almost every week on these conferences, I'm, I'm chairing one of the committees. There's like, you can't do that. Nobody's done that before. It's like, you know, they told the guy that got into those three boats that tried to get over to India from from uh, originally from from Italy. You can't get there from here. You're going to drown. You're going to you know you're going to end up at the end of the world. And he discovered what he thought was India it was actually America. 
So so don't ever tell people you can't do that because you you know you could get there. And Wait a minute, I thought Bugs Bunny discovered America. <laughs> he did. But they just didn't want to change to the history it. books for him. And you don't have to spend a million dollars on an amplifier either to get really great sound. I know a lot of people, just real quick before we, we get out of here, I'm not a huge fan of using commercial amps and residential products unless it's maybe an uber high-end crown. I've just never got really good sound from them. And I know people want to argue. What's your thoughts on that, uh, Gene and Anthony? Well, I think the I'll, I'll answer and then Anthony can. The, the problem I see is when people go out on the internet and they buy the two or three hundred dollar uh, commercial amps that claim they're a thousand watts mm -hmm. and they have a bunch of fans in them. That's just good. Isn't? Yeah, there's no there's no real heat sink in anything, so they have fans running all the time. And what you could do a mod, you could change the fans. I'm like, really, at that point, why don't you just get a real amplifier that's made for consumer audio, not for sound reinforcement? Um, so there's good amps and bad amps, um, and I I'll use residential amps and commercial amps. Like like I said, these days I'm using a lot of this PowerSoft stuff um, that sounds absolutely amazing. It was not designed for residential, even though they're they're doing a big push to get into the studio oh, yeah. panel these days. It is a high end product, um, and it's very very well designed by people who have really good ears. Musicians, you know, in, in Italy, they're Italian, so you know they know cappuccino and chocolate. Um, <laughs> And uh, so they're, they're a good amp. So I, I would not generalize on that. The funny thing is that there's some high-end amps in the Harman brands mm -hmm. that are designed by Crown. You know, they come right out of the commercial space. They put a new case around it. Maybe they change right. some of the knobs and input. So I, I wouldn't generalize that. Yes, there are a lot on the, in the commercial space where, where cost is very, very tight. You know, we, you're, you, you don't have the luxury of doing things at the right price. There's a bunch of them out there that just, don't sound that good because they have distortion problems. They have, you know, whatever. And you, and you, if you start to look at the specs, you'll may notice that. Well, and then the other thing too, and then this is, we're, we're wrapping this up, but there's a quick way to determine, you know, how quiet an amp is just by looking at their spec. Most of the time amplifier companies give you signal to noise ratio at max power. They never give it to you at one watt. So you have to go and you, I could show you how in another video, how you could take that max power rating and translate it down to one watt <laughs> And then mm -hmm. determine if that's an A-weighted measurement or if it's bandwidth limited measurement because that could change the results as well. Generally speaking, I like to see at least 80 dB signal to noise ratio at one watt, um, preferably unweighted, but if it's a class D amp, maybe A-weighted. 90 dB is really good. Like the really good amplifiers at one watt will give you 90 dB SNR. So yeah. that's some of these uh, distribution amps or these uh, commercial amps, the cheaper ones, when I calculate it down to one watt, they're like in the 70s. Right. or 80s and that's not including fan noise which can right. add a it, bad experience if you're close to the uh, it, amplifier it costs money to make a low noise circuit so um you know when you when you're when you're saying eddb down uh from one watt and then you're looking at doing high res audio you realize you need 144 db of dynamic range but now your amplifier is only you know 80 down with maybe 20 db a headroom you're you're miss you're missing on that so one of the things we're going to do in the spec is actually specify noise in millivolts so that there's yeah. just no no confusion. And then also specify this concept of dynamic range, which is sort of the equivalent in video to, to just contrast ratio. How, you know, what's right. the difference between the max and min? Um, and then that will help just by, by eyeballing those numbers to see what it's right. And you don't always have to have a really low, no, low noise app. If you're doing something in an environment that's noisy, what you know, why spend money on something that's super quiet right. when the ambient noise is high, which is what happens a lot in commercial spaces. Right. Low, right. Especially lower end commercial amps. And I know Crown makes some fantastic high end amps along with Lua and the many other companies out there. So, yeah. so we got a super chat here saying I need to do more reviews of uh, products. Yeah, that's that's the problem is um, yeah. I'm only one person and I'm, at, I'm trying to get Matthew online to do amplifier measurements as well. Um, I do want to review some of the higher end crown amps one of these days, but yeah. right now every all my efforts are going to the Audio Hulk Smart Home with Don's help and your help, Anthony, uh, because I think we're doing something that nobody's ever done before, and we're documenting the entire process from start to finish on YouTube, and it's getting noticed. I'm getting calls all the time from manufacturers wanting to be part of this, so it's you should a charge really a mission. You should have like a trip. Somebody wants to come down because I'm telling you this this house is just sick. For lack of a better term, but Anthony, you could come for free. Boy, Anthony, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll bring chocolate. Yes, yes. I'll yes. bring bourbon. All right. So, what are we doing next time? Are we gonna the next time we're gonna do this next Thursday? We're gonna cover, or actually, I'm gonna be in. 
I'm going to be on vacation. I might bring Gene's a microphone. Gene's going on vacation. Gene is yeah. actually going to take a week off. I haven't had vacation. I'm not telling in two anybody years. where he's going. His whole life is a vacation. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, I I vote. I've got a bunch more things to talk about. So we quickly went over the things that relate to power. Notice I didn't spend a lot of time on that because it's pretty straightforward. Then I've got a bunch more slides. If you guys are into this, in two weeks we'll just pick up from here and and keep going. So we'll talk about the things that can potentially matter with sound quality. The things right. that influence the, sound quality. Exactly. A uh, a uh, power. You could say power matters with sound quality or not. Well, if you're if you want dynamics and you want to not clip sure. on triple fortes, you need the power. But the the next set of slides is about things that you. I guess I would just sort of put as like, wow, it sounds really good, regardless mm -hmm. of like whether you're cranking up or not. So I got a, a whole bunch of concepts there, and and that's probably the most controversial part of of this conversation is what does good sound mean? How do you measure it? What do the specs right. tell you and what don't they tell you? And I'm I'm more than aware that we don't know everything about what makes things sound really good. We're, we're yeah. getting there. We're getting there. So, so Don, we got a question for you. When will the smart home be done? <laughs> well, we're going to have the theater done by the 14th. Well, yeah. we're going to have it. To well, the by the end of up. June. By the yeah, end of June. So RBH can come in and do their calibration. Um, yep. We just got a few. We got to get your electrician to put the lighting in, which... Yep. We need to get that done, and um, I'm, we're pretty much close to wrapping it up. We've got probably well, no, we got the outdoor landscape speakers. Well, yeah, we've we got the cameras. Sixty-five with the theater will be about eighty-five percent done. You when are we going to put some? When are we going to put some sniper rifles outside? So in case I get people, I don't want coming to my front oh, door. I do guns are, I don't know nothing about guns. <laughs> you don't know nothing about guns. Yeah, crazy. Uh, and Maybe you got to put your acoustical treatments up too, right? Or we're gonna do that, that next. <laughs> When he yeah. gets back from vacation, we're gonna put those so up. so Anthony, I want to leave you with one question. I'm I'm just kind of curious because there's always a stigma with Pete with audio files not liking receivers, and I love receivers if they're good receivers. What are the percentages of home theater installations that you do that use a receiver as opposed to separates? I'm just kind of curious. Well, yeah. Anthony, a different. Um, that's a that's a good question. Um, there are some really good sounding receivers out there in which the, you know, the amplifiers are just really well designed. You were talking about the Sonkyo product. That thing sounded amazing. You know, on, a, on an AB comparison, the amp sections of those against some, some high end amps sounded every bit as good. And mm -hmm. even Kenwood, you know, not, not a I used to love Kenwood. All. Yeah. For the yeah, money. Make her make the shepherds were great. Their THX stuff was awesome. Right. Um, when you think about it, a really good receiver has perfect gain matching between the preamp and the power amp, so you can get really low noise as a right. result of that. And, and you don't have output buffer circuits that have to go to cables and go back into something. So we actually, you re, you're reducing the distortions, if you want to think of it that way, by keeping it all together. Now, all that being said, a lot of the projects I'm working on are kind of on the upper end, so receivers right. are not in there. It's separates. Um, but that's not because I say... It's not going to sound good with a receiver. Um, so let me give you a, a few cool examples of receivers that work really well. So Yamaha makes receivers that have built-in DSP for room correction. I love those mm -hmm. things. They work well. They sound good. They got plenty of power. And you can go in there and tweak the EQ and all the of the EQ. stuff yep. of, of, of the different Look at that. Here. Look at how yeah, that, I'm cool. excited about these new Yamahas. I really am. Yeah, yeah that's, that's cool. Uh, Storm Audio on the high end makes an integrated surround processor amplifier which is a receiver it just doesn't have a tuner built in really that is amazing it's absolutely amazing it's got the, oh, the amplifier sections are basically straight out of their separates and the decoder set out of their separates it just put it in one class e, right yeah yeah um, yeah uh so i i would i would say don't generalize it receivers are not good sound that's just totally unfair uh they, they can work well if they're designed correctly it doesn't mean they're designed correctly but they can't there's nothing because they're all in one box, there's nothing that says that it can't work well as as long as the power supply is built correctly and all the circuits are built correctly. There's people who go, well, there's going to be a little, little bit of crosstalk between channels. It's like, dude, you do not hear a crosstalk dude. below 20 dB. Or yeah, I've uh, I, I used 20 to measure crosstalk all you need, 20 to 25. The flagship from Danon, like the AVR 5805 back in the day, <laughs> that thing had a better amp section than most dedicated you're multi channel. Still, amp. You're still hurting about selling that thing, aren't you? Dude. I know you are. That uh, was a hundred pound yeah. monster. It was, a, it, was a, it was a Haas dude. That new Marantz that you have though, the new flagship, the, the 8015. Like I don't know. Receiver. Yeah. Have you ever installed an 8015 in a job? Cause it's a really good sounding receiver. It's a badass okay. receiver. It really is a good, good. I mean, there's tons. We really are in a Renaissance. There's a lot of great gear out there. Right. Yep. Yep. All right, guys. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Like I said, we're going to continue on in two weeks to talk about 
what makes or breaks a, uh, an amplifier in terms of sound quality, what specs you can kind of look for as a guide, hopefully that can help you guys make better purchase and decisions. We'll have, of course, more anecdotal stories from myself, Don and, and Anthony. Appreciate you guys all coming here so late at night. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. You get to answer, ask us direct questions, suggest video topics. I'll put this PowerPoint in there as well if you guys want to look at it and follow along with this uh, live stream that we just did. And, and everybody uh, say uh, thank you to Uncle Anthony because it's a really big, big deal that we got him on here. You guys, uh, you should know. Yeah, that. I missed you, man. I, mi I missed yeah, having you. you yep. So we got one last super chat from Mohammed. What are the best speaker systems for IMAX enhanced? Uh, well, the only IMAX enhanced speakers that are certified right Def now are, are, Polk, are the yeah. Def Tech and Polks. And that's kind of an ambiguous spec. I don't really understand that spec. And um, I want to find out more about that. But I know that those are the only two brands of speakers right now that have the IMAX enhanced. We need to have them on the IMAX people to tell it to break it down because I, I still don't understand what it is. I will tell you the new Polk Reserve series look really nice. So yeah. good speakers to check out, and they're very affordable as well. All right, guys, we are wrapped up. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. Keep listening. <laughs>